Hi, welcome to Mooney Reads. My name is Beck, and today I'm going to be talking about all of the books that I read in the month of March. As you all might know, March was Women's History Month, so I tried to focus some of what I was reading on that. My goal was to read only books written by female authors. I didn't totally do that, there were two exceptions, um, but for the majority of the month I did hit that. And I didn't read anything written by male authors. I mean that wasn't clearly totally the goal, but there's at least that. The majority of the point of kind of centering women authors is because they didn't get that sort of attention before, so I don't think that reading a couple of non-binary people in the midst of all that is the worst thing I could have done. But I also want to be clear that I don't lump women and non-binary people together. Um, I just incidentally ended up reading those books. I will actually talk about those two books first, um, and then I'll get into everything else in roughly chronological order of when I read it. I did participate in some various readathons and things like that. Um, I tried to do some of the prompts for the Women's History Month readathon. I also participated in the Zodiacathon and the Queer Weekend um, that's held by the Queer Lit readathon, and I'll talk about which of those books I used for those when I get to them. The first one of those books that did not fit into my goal that I read this month was Pansy by Andrea Gibson. I have talked a whole lot about how much I love Andrea Gibson. Honestly, I needed kind of a comfort read. I was already looking into them because of uh, one of the other videos that I put up. So of course I started to watch more of their performances, which I've done before, but I don't know, I just had a really big urge to read their books, so I reread Pansy. The other book that I read by a non-binary author this month was Upright Women Wanted. I absolutely fell in love with this book. The reason that I ended up reading it was because it was the Queer Lit Readathon's Queer Weekend, and I was trying to think about what audiobook I could listen to out of all of the different audiobooks that I have saved on Scribd. And I wasn't really thinking about the fact that I was only reading women authors, I was only thinking about Queer Weekend, and I was looking at, okay, so what queer books do I have? And of course, Sarah Gailey is a queer author. So I ended up starting it, and it didn't hit me until I was about a quarter of the way through that, oh, wait a minute, I'm only supposed to be reading women authors. Um, but I was already too far in. I was really, really loving it, so I just decided to finish it anyways. Honestly, Upright Woman Wanted was everything that I didn't know that I needed. I've never really considered reading a western other than just to see what it was about because I don't really get it, but this book was perfect. I mean, I don't think that there is a bad way to elevate or pitch this book, honestly. It's a bunch of queer librarians secretly undermining a fascist regime. There is no way that this book was going to be bad, but I just didn't know if it would be one that I'd be into because of the genre, but it was perfect. One of the many great things about this book, too, is that there is actual polyamorous re representation, and that is something that I have been really searching for. Um, I think that I mentioned that uh, in Little and Lion, which I read last month. There was mention of polyamory, there was a secondary character who described herself as polyamorous and was kind of working through that, and it was seen as a legitimate option, and that was nice. In this book, it's also a secondary character who's polyamorous, but it's not in the figuring out phases. There just happens to be a lesbian thruple um, within the book, so I was super excited about that. They also mentioned casually one of the other characters um, experiencing compersion, so that was awesome. If anybody knows of any other books with good polyamorous rep, please put them in the comments because I need them. But Upright Woman Wanted was an absolute treat. Um, I gave it four and a half stars only because it was so short. Short books aren't bad, but I read that book and I wanted it to be a whole series. Like, I wanted it to be just the beginning. But yes, it was really wonderful. Going back and talking about kind of the other books that I read all or part of, the first book that I finished this month was On the Come Up, which I'd started to listen to last month. I read a little bit, I've got this arc, but I did mostly listen to it on audiobook. It was really good. I gave it four and a half stars. There was a lot of good social commentary and a diversity on some of the opinions that they're kind of talking about and commenting on. I don't know. I really enjoyed it. Um, I didn't enjoy it as much as The Hate You Give, but that's a pretty high bar. 
Um, I definitely recommend it though. The next book that I read some of this month was Face in the Mirror by J.T. Collins. I read part of this book and I put it down. I don't think it's one that I'm going to permanently DNF, but it's certainly one that I'm going to set down for a minute. I bought this book during a Pride event. Um, there was a, a small publisher. I think a lot of their books focus on LGBT people. There were a lot of lesbian novels there and I ended up buying I think three of them and this was one. It's about a girl who is figuring herself and trying to come out in a family that does a lot of missionary work in Africa. So she's kind of in this very conservative home that's kind of isolated. And I do want to finish this book. There were just several things that made me sort of uncomfortable that surrounded kind of the missionary work. A couple of comments that like offhandedly kind of dehumanize people. And there is a chance that throughout the course of the book maybe she talks about this. Um, I don't know. But I don't really want to finish it right now. Like, I, I do want to give it a chance, but I don't know. I will read this at some point. I did start it this month, so I wanted to talk a little bit about it. So, now on to the first book that I actually, actually started and finished this month. Kase's on an Apron. I also read and finished Kase Sun and Cherry Blossom. I actually did a review for the first section of this series. It was adorable and gay. Definitely a very sweet read. Gay fluff is definitely one of the things that is a comfort read for me um, and I really needed that. I definitely recommend this if you're in the market for um, kind of more relationship romantic Yuri. These Kase-san books, both of them, although I really only needed one of them, fit a prompt for the Women's History Month readathon and that is to choose a book that's set outside of the United States. These are set in Japan. The next book that I have is a graphic novel and that is Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me by Mariko Tamaki and Rosemary Valero O'Connell. This book I used as a part of the Women's History Month readathon and I used it to fulfill the prompt to uh, read a book written by at least two female authors. I gave this book five stars. It gave me a lot of different feelings. This is another gay graphic novel, but while the Kase-san series is definitely high fluff, this one was not. Um, it definitely talks about relationships and it talks about toxic relationships and how they can exist even for queer people which is a theme that we'll get into in another one of these books later. To start off with, the artwork is absolutely beautiful. Um, the way that they use color, they only use pink throughout the whole thing. The rest of it is black and white, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and it made for some really beautiful stuff. But also the way that they handle the issues in this is really wonderful. It hit home for me in a lot of ways. If I had had this book in high school or even in early college, I think that I would have possibly been able to do some things differently in my own life. Um, and that's not even with it being like a gay couple because that was not my circumstance um, with me and the person that I was with, but just this idea of not having to put up with certain behavior, um, I think that it's additionally important because it's kind of in a queer context. Also, I absolutely adored her best friend in this. Doodle has my entire heart. The next book that I'm going to be talking about flows from Laura Dean very well, and that is In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. This is the best book that I have read all year. I absolutely love this book. It is a memoir. So this book focuses on the author's experience in an abusive relationship and in abusive queer relationships. A lot of it is told in second person. Each of the chapters are very small. So you kind of get fragments of their relationship um, and kind of intermittently there are some first person um, pieces that kind of situate this societally. Throughout she talks about how other queer women have been in these situations and have been overlooked by the law and all of that um, and kind of contextualizes herself. The experience reading this book was just absolutely incredible. It's an important book to read in general but it also, um, I don't know, I just, I felt it on a really deep level. I 
highly, highly recommend this book. This was one of those five star reads that I wish could be like a six star. It's that good. It also filled the prompt for the Women's History Month readathon for a memoir or biography. The next book I read, I actually listened to an audiobook, and that is Kings, Queens, and Inbetweens by Tanya Botego. I used this to complete a prompt in the Women's History Month readathon, and that was to read something written by an Indigenous author. I really did not enjoy this book. Really, the beginning of the book was very two star for me. Towards the end, there was a lot of three star stuff, maybe even glimpses of four star, but there were just some things in this book that just really sat with me the wrong way. So throughout the book, um, the main character ends up getting this best friend who's a transgender woman. There are a couple things that are wrong with this character. First of all, you don't really know that she's a trans woman until, or at least I didn't even figure out that she was a trans woman until a decent way past when we met her. Um, she was framed as a drag queen, which of course you can be a drag queen and a trans woman. But at no point in the book that they really differentiate the difference between the two of them. I think they kind of played with talking about the difference, but like if I had been totally unaware, I would think that they were the same thing. The other thing that was wrong with that character is that it heavily plays upon the trans fairy godmother sort of trope. Like, she's there, but she's there to fix things, and she's not really there to be her own character. She does have, have some details, like you do get to know some things about her, um, but she is mostly there for plot convenience, I think. If she wasn't there, a lot of the story wouldn't have happened, which isn't inherently a bad thing, but it, it absolutely plays into tropes that have been identified. Um, and it was just really unfortunate. Now the bigger problem that I had was that the main character, who is 17, sneaks into various adult spaces um, in order to engage with what she's engaging with. So the drag shows that she goes to initially are 18 and up. Um, there's alcohol there and some of the stuff is a little bit more sexual. Um, and really while she's in these adult spaces, she's also talking to adults um, and flirting with adults and getting relationships with some adults, some of them friend relationships and some of them not. And it just made me really, really deeply uncomfortable. There is a, easily a way that this book could have been done that did not include the minor sneaking into adult spaces, um, and drinking and engaging in all of this other stuff. Just making her a college student it would not have changed very much. She could still live at home. She could still be going to like a local two-year college um, and it wouldn't make me feel so gross. That just, I, I just couldn't really deal with that to be honest. So I ended up giving this book two and a half stars. The next book that I read was A Blade So Black by L.L. McKinney. This book fit the Women's History Month readathon prompt of a retelling because A Blade So Black is a retelling of Alice in Wonderland. It's more modern. Um, it was also the first book that I read for the Zodiacathon. It fit the prompt for my sign, which was my Lilith sign, which was to read a book that takes place not in our world. It's also one that I was buddy reading, which was the second prompt for the Zodiacathon. I talk more in depth about this book in my Zodiacathon reading vlog. Overall, it was a pretty okay book. Um, it didn't really send me. I kind of didn't love the pacing. And there was also some relationship stuff that made me feel a little bit weird. I'm not really a huge fan of love triangles and the mentor mentee thing that it was hinting at also makes me deeply uncomfortable. Um, so I ended up giving this three stars, a very like ambivalent three stars. The next book that I started reading again for the Zodiacathon was Making Politics. Emotion and Act Up's Fight Against AIDS by Deborah Gould. This fit the Zodiacathon prompt um, to pick something with dark themes and something that scares you. It also fit the prompt for a mostly black cover. Um, again, if you watch my reading vlog, you can find out more about it. I only got about a third of the way through, but it is a really fantastic book. It's one that I'm looking forward to reading the rest of. Um, if I start rambling about it, It'll make this video exponentially longer, so check out the reading vlog if you're interested in this. It is a non-fiction, um, very kind of academic sociology, political science book. Um, 
but it is really wonderful so far. The next book that I read was The Midwinter Witch by Molly Ossertag. This is the third in the Witch Boy trilogy. I read this, like I said, for Zodiacathon. It fit the mostly black cover prompt and also technically the dark themes prompt. This also covered um, for the Women's History Month readathon, it covered to choose a book with a female villain. I loved this book so much. I, like I said, I have a full review for it, but I'm obsessed. This is a middle grade graphic novel. It's super cute and it hits on so many important things. I implore you to check out the Witch Boy trilogy because it is just absolutely everything. Next, I'm going to be getting into some books that I read for the Queer Weekend. Um, the first one is one that I started. I didn't quite get to finish. I plan on finishing next month. And that is The Gilda Stories by Joel Gomez. This is a queer vampire book. Um, it has a lot of commentary on colonialism and different things like that. It's really interesting so far. The next two books that I read for the Queer Lit Readathon were uh, The Lumberjanes Volumes 1 and 2. I would also say that that covers the Women's History Month readathon prompt to choose a book that somebody's debut. If Goodreads is correct, it was Shannon Waters and Grace Ellis's first book. Um, certainly it's the first book where all of the authors collaborated together, um, so hopefully that counts. I really loved the first two Lumberjanes books. It was really cute and wholesome. I liked the format that they did. They kind of break up the little episodes by putting a page of the Lumberjanes, which is basically like a Girl Scouts handbook. So most of the things that they do involve or are in the same vein as one of the patches that they can get. So they give you a little description of how to get the patch and then it shows you their little adventure. There's also an overarching plot line that was really interesting as well. I ended up giving those two four stars. I've already mentioned Upright Women Wanted. I read that for the Queer Lit Readathon. Um, the final book that I read for the Queer Lit Readathon was Wandering Sun Volume 2. Now, I talked about reading Volume 1, and I absolutely adored it. It's a slice-of-life manga about a trans boy and a trans girl who are best friends. And it starts with them in fifth grade, and they're figuring themselves out. They have another best friend who's helping them, too. And it's just super cute. And a lot of those things carry through to the second one. Um, they also hit on some important things like bullying in a really realistic way. I think my most favorite moment from the whole thing was when this bully calls the main character um, an obscene name. And um, the best friend basically goes and just dumps the whole tray of food on his head. Honestly, that was just great. However, I couldn't really give this a star rating because there were some elements in this that I just am deeply uncomfortable with and if it's not resolved in subsequent volumes I don't really know what I'm gonna do with myself. This is technically a little bit spoilery so I'll put a timestamp so that you can skip past it. Um, really I'm not gonna try to put in a whole bunch of details. The two of them end up meeting this older trans woman. Um, they meet her at like some sort of restaurant and they become friends with her which could be cool maybe a little bit weird it's like an adult just making kids with random like fifth grader or sixth graders at this point but it does make kind of a creepy turn and I just if they don't resolve this and figure this out I don't think I can continue the series which really sucks because the rest of it is so good not only that but I have a number of volumes sitting on my shelf um, so I kind of feel like I have to read it, but if it gets too weird, I'm gonna have to drop it, which really, really sucks. I didn't expect that at all because I'd seen the anime. Granted, the anime only covers... I don't think it covers the first couple of volumes just because of where it starts out. Um, there's less of a focus on kind of the best friend. So I guess it probably starts at volume three or four. I'm not totally sure. But I was just really upset about that. So I hope that this resolves itself. Because it would be a really cute series if they had cut out the creepy people. Which I guess the same thing can be said about a lot of other things. The final book that I read this month is The Words Don't Fit in My Mouth by Jessica Care Moore. Um, this book fits in with the Women's History Month readathon prompt of a book that has less than a thousand ratings on Goodreads. 
And this overall was a really good book. It's a poetry book that was written in the late 1990s. And a lot of it just in general is focused on the experience of being a black woman. Um, there are some things where she like focuses more on gender or focuses more on race or focuses more on politics. Um, and of course, where all of those overlap. Alongside those things, she also talks about grief in several of her poems, um, specifically looking at her dad. I really enjoyed it. I think that there were some that I was like less stoked about than others, but I mean there's a lot of pretty brilliant wordplay and stuff like this. Um, I think most of the maybe more ambivalent feelings that I felt about some of it might be the age of it a little bit. There were still, you know, a couple of poems that really hit me. Um, I think that in most poetry collections there are some of those that kind of stand out. Um, I also started to look into seeing her performing these. There are some videos of her doing some of these online and that was really interesting too. Um, kind of one of the few negative things about this is that there is a little bit of like slut shaming which again I think that's probably what I was getting at when I was talking about the age of it. That might not be something that she would incorporate were she writing today. Um, so that was kind of a problem. I enjoyed this. Like I said, I gave it four stars. So those are all the books that I read for the month of March. If you've read any of them, let me know what you thought about them down below. Like always, thank you all so much for watching. Bye.